Hi, uh, and welcome everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this year's NCNGT to make this possible again, and um, the organizers of the topic group, uh, discrete subgroups of Lee groups, um, for inviting me. So today I want to talk about the real spectrum compactification of the Hitchin component. And in this first talk, I would like to define um, what is Teichmüller space and the Hitchin component. And then we're gonna have a short talk about some aspects of compactifications. And then to dive into the topic, we need to introduce some real algebraic geometry. Okay, so let's start with Teichmüller space. So S is a closed connected oriented surface of genus G at least two. And then the Teichmüller space of S, so denoted T of S, is a connected component of the space of all discrete and faithful representations from the fundamental group of my surface into PSL to R. And we take this up to PSL to R conjugation action. So let me write this down. So by this, I mean the conjugation action. And here, so this is one of two connected components. So the space of all discrete faithful representations from two connected components, and there's a way to single out one of them using the orientation on our surface, and this is called the Teichmüller space. So why do I give this point of view of Teichmüller space? I want to view this as um, a connected component inside what is called the character variety. So we look at the space of all homomorphisms into PSL2R, and we quotient out by this action. And this space is called the character variety. So this leads us to study this connected components. And now, instead of studying connected components into PSL2R, what we can do, we can study connected components into the space in the space of all homomorphisms from the fundamental group of the surface to PSL NR up to PSL NR conjugation. And this is for n for all n bigger equal than two. And this will lead us to the definition of the Hitchin component. Okay, so now I want to um, explain to you a very particular representation that we can consider in this higher character variety. So higher means that the n is now larger or equal than two. And we take yoda n to be the unique, unique irreducible n-dimensional representation of PSL2R. Um, if you want to like know more, this can be realized by letting PSL2R act on the space of homogeneous polynomials of degree n minus one by a change of variables. Now, this is not very complicated. This is a very explicit representation. And now this allows us to define um, the Hitchin component. So the connected component of this character variety, chi s comma n, that contains a representation of the form yoda n composed rho for rho in the Teichmüller space is called the Hitchin component. And we write hit s comma n. Okay, so maybe now some remarks are in order. So the only thing I told you, we take a very special representation that is given by composing an element in Teichmüller space with this 
a reusable n-dimensional representation, and we take its connected component in the character ID. So this was introduced by Hitchin in 1992. And it turns out for n equal to two, we recover Teichmüller space. And like, maybe why is this? Because if you look at Yoda two, you just get the identity on PSL 2R and Teichmüller space is connected. So you take the connected component of an element in Teichmüller space, you recover Teichmüller space. And it turns out that if you look at it a different way, that elements in the in Teichmüller space parametrize hyperbolic structures on our surface. So somehow the question is now, do these high, this, does the Hitchin component for n bigger equal than two also parametrize some geometric structures? And there's a result by Choi and Goldman for n equals three. We see that the Hitchin component parametrizes convex real projective structures on our surface. Um, I don't want to go into any more like um, detail here. Another like thing that I maybe can point out is that Hitchin proved when introducing the Hitchin component that um, it is homeomorphic to like R to the two minus two G times one minus N square. So it's, um, it's, it's in particular contractible. And um, now I want to, okay, this was all I wanted to say about the Hitchin component. And now let's go talk a bit about compactifications. Okay, so there's a compactification called the Thurston compactification. So this is defined geometrically. So we've seen that Teichmüller space parametrizes hyperbolic structures. So we can use hyperbolic lengths of curves to define the Thurston compactification. And now I want to tell you about like three particularly nice properties that we will want to um, generalize for the Hitchin component. So the first one is that Teichmüller space is open and dense in the Thurston compactification. It's like very natural. And then we also have that the Thurston compactification is homeomorphic to a disk of dimension 6G minus six. So this is a closed ball of dimension 6G minus six. And furthermore, the points in the boundary, they correspond to actions on our trees. And these actions are very well understood and they have a sort of geometric meaning. Okay, so why is this, why are all these properties particularly nice? Now I want to give a small example. For example, the mapping glass group of our surface. So this is nothing else but the space of all self homeomorphisms S to S. So let's call this phi up to isotopy. This group um, acts on Teichmüller space by precomposing, right? Um, an element in Teichmüller space was just a representation from our fundamental group into PSL2R. So what is the thing that we can do? We can take an element phi in the mapping class group and let it act on rho by precomposing rho with phi star inverse. So this is the induced map on the fundamental group of our surface. Okay, and then the, the important point is now that this action extends to a continuous action on the Thurston compactification. So we get um, 
an action of the mapping class group of our surface onto the Thurston compactification, which is a closed ball. And so this action will have a fixed point. And this is a result by Brouwer that we already learn in topology. And the, the, the point is now um, that this action and its fixed point properties allows us to study the mapping class group. For example, um, this allows to classify the mapping classes and it allows to study the subgroup structure of the mapping class group. And it turns out that the mapping class group in the same way will also act on the hitching component, right? This was the representations from surface group into PSL uh, NR instead of 2R. So maybe if we find a good compactification for the hitching compo component, then this is, allows us to um, conclude more things about the mapping class group and maybe other things. Okay, so the goal is, as I stated, find a compactification with good topological properties. So as we saw before, we maybe want this to be this to be the hitching component, which I called H here, to be open and dense in its compactification. We want maybe this compactification to be Hausdorff, at least. We want to have some sort of fixed point theorem, right? So we used Brouwer's fixed point theorem to conclude something about this action. And points in the boundary should somehow correspond to actions of some sort. So this is very vague. This is more like informal, what we are maybe looking for. And the idea we're following now is the idea of Brumfield. He used real algebraic geometry um, already in 1988 to construct a compactification so this is what we called TRSP for real spectrum for Teichmüller space. Okay, so now let me say what this compactification, what nice properties it has. For example, there is a surjection from the real spectrum compactification onto the Thurston compactification. So this is a continuous, surjection. And for this, there is a fixed point theorem. So that's good news. And the, namely the problem is that the definition of the Thurston compactification used the geometric information that Teichmüller space encodes. And we don't really know like what if there's what we can say there about the Hitchin component. So this is not, not easily generalizable. Whereas Brumfield's approach is. So this is more uh, a more general um, concept that he introduced here. And to prove, for example, that now there's a fixed point when we look at the action on the Thurston compactification. We, if we know this theorem by Brumfield, there is no need to know that the Thurston compactification is in fact a closed ball. Okay, so let's go into some real algebraic geometry. Okay, let's start by defining the main object. So we already know that, um, algebraic set in Rm for some m is a finite union of subsets defined by finitely many polynomial equalities, for example, a circle. And if we now, if we now want to go into the study of real algebraic geometry, an important other like object that we need to consider are semi-algebraic sets. And semi-algebraic sets are very similar to algebraic sets, but we additionally allow um, inequalities. To define our sets. So let's give some examples. So 
maybe the first obvious example is that algebraic implies semi-algebraic. And as I said before, maybe you, you can see this, that like a, a smiley face like this is a semi-algebraic set. And you might think that maybe, well, almost everything is semi-algebraic. So here's an example of something that is not semi-algebraic. So this infinite staircase is not semi-algebraic. Oops, remove this, <laughs> not semi-algebraic. And how will we apply this? Well, it turns out that the character variety and the Hitchin component are homeomorphic to closed semi-algebraic subsets of some Rm. And this is um, a consequence of the um, geometric invariant theory by Richardson and Sloderby. So this is a more general statement, but it will in particular imply that the character variety and the Hitchin component, therefore also Teichmüller space, are homeomorphic to some semi-algebraic subsets. And there's um, a fact that a semi-algebraic subset in Rm admits what is called a real spectrum compactification, which we denote by X, R, S, P. And now we come to the fixed point theorem that tells us if phi from X to X is a semi-algebraic homeomorphism and X is contractible. Then phi has a fixed point in the real spectrum compactification of X. I do not wish to like define it here um, because that takes us too far. Um, but I want to give now some like nice properties. And in particular, this, this fixed point theorem can be applied to the Hitchin component, which we saw um, earlier as a fact that Hitchin proved that this is homeomorphic to R to the or like characteristic of S times one minus N squared. Okay, let's, let's look at some properties of the, some properties of the real spectrum compactification. So we start with a semi-algebraic set. Then we see that um, the real spectrum compactification is a compact house of space and X lies inside there, open and dense. This was two, one of the properties we wanted to look, look at. Another important thing is, since we're concerned with connected components, is that this inclusion provides a bijection on the level of connected components. So that's good news. And we saw before by the theorem by Brumfield here, that if X is contractible, there's a fixed point theorem. And the last property now that goes a bit more into like the details of like, or a bit more into the construction of the real spectrum compactification that says that points in XRSP, so it's the real spectrum compactification correspond to homomorphisms from the coordinate ring now in M variables into F, where F is a real closed field containing R. Okay, I'll define in the next slide what, um, what real closed field means, but let me make one remark. So if you if you are a point in X, so not on the boundary, 
then these homomorphisms will go to R. And for points at infinity, these homeomorphisms will go to F that are non-Archimedean. And I'll define this now in the last slide. So let's see what is a real closed field. So um, an ordered field F is real closed if every positive element is a square. Okay, that's the first condition. And odd degree polynomials have a root. So this should like really strongly remind you of uh, the reals. So the reals are an example of a real closed field. And we say F is non-Archimedean if it does not satisfy the Archimedean property. So there exists an element K in F such that K is bigger than N for all N in N. So there exists they exist elements in F that are larger than any natural number. And let's end here with uh, some examples. So the first one is R is real closed. But also if we look at the algebraic numbers intersected with R, they're also real closed. C is not orderable. So we need to intersect the algebraic numbers with R. And you will you can convince yourself that if you're a positive element, you have a square and an odd degree polynomial will have a root. The second example that's maybe a bit um, more exotic is if you take um, the fractional field of the polynomial ring R of X and you define um, a rational function to be positive if at some time t, you're positive. So recall that f is a fact, in fact a quotient of two polynomials. So at some point there will they will have no no roots anymore. And if t is larger than that, you can look at the sign. There will be no sign changes anymore. And then you can say it is positive if this function is positive. And this is an ordered field, but it's not real closed. Why? X itself, the polynomial X has no root, but X is positive. And it turns out that R of X with this order is non-Archimedean, right? Why? Because X is larger than any natural number. And now I want to finish with an example of the real spectrum compactification. And if you want to learn more about it, come like to the office hours and ask me, then I ex can explain you what, what you get. But if you do this whole construction, you will see that the real spectrum compactification of R is just the two point cap compactification. So this should be a minus infinity plus infinity. So this is just the two point compactification of R. Okay, and now we're at the end of the first talk. Um, and if you have questions, um, you can come to the office hours and look at the second talk and let me advertise this. So what are we gonna do in part two? So in part two, we're gonna look at a geometric interpretation of the points in the real spectrum compactification of the Hitchin component. In particular, we're gonna define 
positive and F Hitchin representations. So these F are gonna be real closed fields, different from R. And we're gonna talk about what is the Tarski-Seidenberg principle for R. Um, and yeah, if you're excited to learn more, um, come to the, or listen to the second part. And yeah, see you. Thanks for watching.